Are we okay? <laughs> good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Bethesda United Methodist Church. It's good to see everybody here this morning and glad to welcome those who are joining us online. How many people came out to the Easter parade yesterday? I know Judy was there. <laughs> it was a fun time, I think had by all. And all those little kids, I think, really enjoyed having candy thrown at them. A lot of candy hit Joe in the head. <laughs> uh, but it was a good time. And some really good floats, weren't there, Judy? It was hard to judge. Yeah. Except some of them should have got awards, and we didn't have any more awards. Yeah, yeah. It was really fantastic. We're getting better and better. Yeah, yeah. So... Good to see everybody here. I'm especially glad to see Tanya here with us. And glad to have Elaine with us. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's begin with a moment of prayer. Gracious God, we just thank you so much for this day, Lord. We're so thankful for each and every day that you bless us with. And Lord, we're so thankful that we get to join together as your community of faith right here in this beautiful sanctuary Lord, we ask that as we gather, you would open our hearts and minds to you. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. May this be a time that truly brings us closer to you and closer to each other as we hear your word proclaimed. May this be a time that brings all praise and glory to your name, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. We stand and sing with us. Cross the empty grave. 
Our gospel lesson comes to us this morning from the Gospel of John, chapter 11. It's verses 1 through 45. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her, Mar and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. After having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twins, said to his fellow disciples, let us all go that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but he was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came, where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. 
It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and his feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us bow for a moment of prayer. Gracious and almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Do you need anything else? No, you can't leave. <laughs> Try the cough drop first. <laughs> if it doesn't work, you're allowed to leave. <laughs> oh. So this is a painting done by Rembrandt of the raising of Lazarus. There are several famous painters uh, that did paintings of this scene. It, I thought it was really interesting. If you're interested in art, uh, you might just Google that online and see. It's, for, it's really a, a neat thing, I think. Oh, I'm sorry, I put this down. It's Tintoretto, not Rembrandt. There is one by Rembrandt. This one's Tintoretto. Okay, so. The death of a loved one is one of the most disruptive things that can happen to us in life. The death of a loved one changes our sense of reality. It rocks our world. The death of someone we're close to can cause us to rethink everything about our lives. And I'm looking out here and I see many people who have recently lost loved ones. So I pray God's comfort for you, and then he would take away your cough. You know, ideally, when someone we love dies, we have others to turn to in a time of grief, others who will share those same feelings, and together we can lean on each other and support each other and cry together and laugh at the happy memories uh, that we had with this person together. That's a way for us to get through the pain together, right? Sometimes the death of a loved one can bring out the worst in people, and probably there are people that have experienced this here. Sometimes that feeling of grief and pain, I don't know, it brings up anger and uh, other intense feelings that can come out at this time of grief. One thing that we can count on is God's help. God is there for us. We can turn to God in prayer. It might not come the way we think the help is going to come, but the help is coming. The help is coming. Steve and I had only been married a little over a year when his mother died, and Steve has three younger siblings. Steve's the oldest, so he was the executor of the will. So, we really hoped that as we worked through the settling of the estate that we would draw the family closer together. We began, began by having roundtable discussions of how to approach things, and we began with prayer. 
Steve was the only sibling to have a spouse, so I was invited to be a silent secretary. I just wrote down notes, whatever they said we needed to do. And as I watched, things went from exaggerated kindness and accommodation to tension, to hostility, to war. Steve tried to combat the negativity by returning to prayer, but eventually not even prayer worked in this uh, situation. The most uh, uh, really astounding thing that I saw happen was Steve's brother had some paintings that he had done that were really, we thought, quite good, and his parents had displayed them around the house, and he decided to destroy these paintings. And Steve and I thought that Steve's three sons would like to have a painting by their uncle, um, so we asked for uh, a painting for each of the sons, but he chose to destroy them rather than give them away. It was really an ugly thing, and now looking back on it and reflecting, it was coming out of his deep grief, I believe, for the loss of his mother, you know? Um, but sometimes that is what happens. Ugly things come out rather than helpful and, and uh, compassionate things. And you hear about this in all kinds of situations when people can't have things the way they want. Sometimes it brings out really ugliness in people. But in the worst of situations, God helps. And this is something for us to think about because when we talk about carrying our cross, what do you all think of, and you don't have to shout it out loud, but just think in your mind, what do you think of when somebody says you have to carry your cross? We're supposed to carry our cross. What thing comes to mind that you're carrying that is carrying your cross? It is the mean-spiritedness of this world, the unfairness of this world. When people do something that's ugly, we carry our cross when instead of answering them with the same ugly, we answer them with Jesus. We answer them with forgiveness. We answer them with love. That is carrying our cross. Because this world is not fair, and people in this world can be really mean and ugly. Is that not true? Yes. So, we can't change other people, but we can not let our hearts be changed by the meanness and the ugliness and try to be forgiving. Now, that doesn't mean you have to do whatever, whatever people are trying to get you to do, right? You don't have to do that. You're doing what Jesus calls you to do, but you can be forgiving in your heart of the ugliness. So this is at least part of what's going on here in this raising of Lazarus story. This uh, raising of Lazarus brought out unbelievable hostility from some people. The Jewish leaders wanted to kill Lazarus. And they also used this miracle as a reason for wanting to kill Jesus. Instead of being thrilled that death had been conquered, they were really kind of siding with death and instead wanted Jesus and Lazarus out of the way. They did not want to lose their own power and authority in this world. They were afraid of anything that threatened the false peace that they lived with. Do you know what false peace is? True peace is when we do God's will. False peace is when we keep everyone quiet because they're not allowed to speak against one particular voice. That's a false peace. Real true peace allows every voice to be heard and we all work for God's will. So they were living with a false peace because the Pharisees wouldn't allow people to speak. They wanted to say what people could say. They claimed that they were waiting for the Messiah, but they really only wanted a Messiah that they could predict and control. 
They wanted to possess the Messiah. But Jesus is not someone who can be contained. Jesus is too big for that. Even his closest followers were unable to predict what he would do next. Jesus thinks and acts outside the box of human thinking and acting. He follows the will of God, and he shows us how to live our lives according to that same will. Scripture tells us that Jesus had, tr had retreated into the wilderness where John the Baptist had done his baptizing. Oh, and I got riled up here and let my phone go off, so I gotta move the slide here. Okay. So this is John 11, three. While he was there, a message came to him. Lord, he whom you love is ill. Jesus responds indicating that he knows more about the situation than the message conveyed to him. He says this illness does not lead to death, but rather it is for God's glory so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Then, instead of rushing to the side of his friend, he remains where he is two more days. Then he says to his followers, let's go to Judea again. Judea is where Lazarus lived in Bethany, and Bethany is only about two miles from Jerusalem. The disciples protest returning there because, as we learned in chapter 10, the Jewish leaders tried to stone Jesus, and that's in this verse, um, because <laughs> Jesus made the claim that he and the Father are one. Even though they are puzzled at Jesus wanting to return to Judea, and I have to say that that verse that says that um, Thomas said, oh yeah, let's go back and die with them, I think that's humor. I think John was putting some humor in the gospel, okay? Sometimes I think we're afraid to laugh because, you know, it's scripture, but I think that's humor. <laughs> so um, when he gets to Bethany, he does not enter the town or the home of Mary and Martha most likely because he does not want to call attention to himself. And Martha comes to meet him. And she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. With this statement, she attests to her faith in Jesus. Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha responds by acknowledging her belief in the resurrection a general resurrection that will come in the last day. But Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Jesus is telling Martha and you and me that we do not have to wait until the kingdom of God comes in its fullness, we can enter the kingdom of God today. There is resurrection and life available to us today. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the resurrection. Jesus is the life. Now Mary comes and she falls at the feet of Jesus and she says the same thing as her sister did. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus becomes agitated because she and his followers, they just don't get it. So there are some present who are mumbling complaints. If he could open the eyes of a blind man, why didn't he keep this man from dying? They go to the tomb, which would have been outside of town, and away from the house. And Jesus asks them to roll the stone away from the tomb, then prays a prayer of thanksgiving to God, and he commands Lazarus to come out. And Lazarus, a dead man, came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. 
And the final verse says, Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. Jesus conquered death. He brought a man out of the grave after he had been dead four days. He conquered death. Those who were willing to submit to the power and authority of Jesus rejoiced and they believed in him. But there were all also others who refused to believe and they began to plot to kill Jesus and to kill Lazarus. Lazarus had been given new life. New life was available to all, but there were some who rejected this new life because they could not control it, and so they would rather see Lazarus and Jesus dead than allow them to exist outside their control. God helps. God is always there to help us. So this scripture lesson prepares us for what is coming. And it's coming in our lives, too. Palm Sunday. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday when we celebrate the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem for the final time. Then on Maundy Thursday, we remember the Last Supper that Jesus had with his disciples. After worship today, uh, the worship committee is going to talk about what we're going to do on Monday, Thursday. But what I have in mind, and I hope that you would be interested in, is finding out about the meal that Jesus ate that night. It's called a Seder meal. It's the most important holiday in the Jewish calendar. It's Passover, Passover meal. And it has some rather unusual things that they eat that are symbolize different parts of their history. So I hope you'll come out on Thursday and learn uh, about this, and I hope that I'll have some for you to taste and see um, what all is involved in a Seder meal. And then, of course, we have Good Friday, and on Good Friday, we are going to have the church sanctuary open from 12 to 1 for prayer. So hope that you'll come out and um, participate in prayer. And then, of course, Easter. Easter Sunday, the day of glorious resurrection. Holy Week is a time of high highs and low lows. But in the end, Christ conquers the lowest of lows, death. And we who claim to be his followers rejoice because we know that he has brought us resurrection and new life. There's nothing that can keep us down as long as we submit to the power and authority of Christ in our lives. When Lazarus rose and Jesus' command, Jesus said, Unbind him and let him go. Unbind him and let him go. This is such a tremendously important verse. We must strive to do this for each other. We must help each other tear off the bindings that hold us down so that we can walk with Christ, so that we can really grab onto this new life. Each week we gather to praise God and to thank God for his many blessings in our lives. We also gather for the purpose of unfettering ourselves. You know, I say it every week in our prayer. It's time to lay down the things that are burdening us and holding us back. The things that cause us fear and doubt, worry and concern. We have to help each other lay those things down. Give them to God. Leave them here. Lay down the obstacles to God's grace. So each Sunday, you're welcome to come to the altar to do that. You can do it right in your seat. Lay down your pain, lay down your jealousy, lay down your loneliness, lay down your pride, your envy, your desire for power and control, whatever it is that holds you back from fully receiving God's grace and love and mercy and forgiveness. Lay it down. Submit your life to the authority and power of God. Let the Holy Spirit be your guide. 
Do you know what the name Lazarus means? God is my help. That's the name Lazarus. God is my help. God will help you gain the gifts he has for you. Now, an interesting fact. The village of Bethany, where Lazarus and Martha and Mary lived, is no longer located where it was at the time of this miracle. You see how back in the time of this miracle, it was just a few miles, I believe it was like six or seven miles from Jerusalem. You see the two little red dots in the middle there. But this, because of the tomb where Lazarus was raised, uh, became such a popular place for people to come to, it is now the center of town. The town has actually moved, and the center of town is this tomb. And the name has been changed. And you can't quite read it, I know, up there, if we were able to go. <laughs> you would be able to. <laughs> but it's called El Azarie. And that is Lazarus. God helps. That's what that means. That's the whole name of the town now. It has changed to that. Jesus raised Lazarus. That was a mighty miracle. He is still doing great works today. His resurrection and life is available to you and me and to all those who are grieving the loss of a loved one, to all who suffer from poverty or job loss or hunger, loneliness, illness. We must help each other unbind and let these things go. When we unbind others around us and release them from our judgments about their situations, we're also unbinding our own minds and hearts and accepting them as our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we're living into the kingdom of God. God is my help and your help. God wants to help us. He wants us to have life in abundance. Amen. And now I have a little bit of homework for you. Could you do a little homework for me? If you're able right now, you can turn in your Bible to chapter 12 in John. It's just what comes after this um, verses that I've been talking to you about today. Chapter 12, verses 9 to 11. I'm going to read it to you. When the great crowd of the Jews learned that he was there, they came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death as well, since it was on account of him that many of the Jews were deserting and were believing in Jesus. Now, you know how you grew up hearing in John where it says, his beloved disciple or the beloved one. He says it over and over again. And who did you hear that beloved one was? You heard John himself, right? That never made sense to me. Never made sense to me because aren't we supposed to be humble? Why would he be saying that I'm his beloved disciple and be putting him in there? Well, this wonderful man, Ben Witherington, did this great study on John and he discovered this and I think it makes so much sense. Up until John 12, 9 through 11, he never says beloved. He never says that, the beloved disciple, the beloved one. He never says that. He says in that passage I just read to you that Lazarus was the one he loved. It says that. And then after these verses, you never hear Lazarus' name mentioned again in the Gospel of John. So your assignment is, Search for it, see if you can find it. You'll never see it again, but this is where you start hearing the beloved one. So, Ben Witherington thinks Lazarus is the beloved disciple, and I tend to agree with him, and I think that is so interesting because we all grew up thinking it was John. So that's my assignment for you. Study the Gospel of John. Okay. 
I was doing that to give you time to get down here. <laughs> and so we will now take an offering if the ushers would come forward. <laughs> oh, I love Devin. <laughs> stand for the doxology. Okay, we come to the time in our worship service when we do our intercessory prayers. And so in our book, we have an unspoken, a Pauletta Kirk, Tiffany Moore, who had hip surgery, uh, praise and prayers for new parents, Alicia and Noah Cornelius, new baby girl, and new baby girl, Carolina. And their grandma is here with us this morning, and she's not too happy. She's not beaming too much, Wendy Henderson. And great-grandma and grandpa are here, Elaine. So isn't that wonderful? Yes. So glad. What a, a great blessing. Um, other prayer concerns we have are in the bulletin. Larry Myers... Uh, Tony Krotz, Paulette Kirk, Hilda Hoffman, and other unspoken requests. Leah Estep and family, and Tracy Jarvis, who's here with us, and we're glad. And Steve Atkins, Ann Brown, Wally Butler, Brandy Carter, Emma Carter, 
Mary Ruth Doby, Reed Everhart, Jim Hooker, Linda Jarvis, Elaine Latham, yay, she's here, Patsy Madrim, Jack Marble, and we're glad Jackie's here, David McDaniel, Mary Alice Myers, Sandra Nunn, Georgiana Ray, Frida Schof, hi Frida, Milton Wiesner, Doug Westbrook, Joe Whitman, and Shirley Yeltz. Are there any others that they didn't make it into the book or are we all good? Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, you are so good to us and Lord, we just wanna to come together and give you all thanks and praise. You bless us in so many ways. You bless us with our good health. You bless us with shelter, with food, not only meeting our basic needs like that, but you bless us with love from family, from friends, from neighbors, sometimes from strangers. You bless us in so many ways, and sometimes we're so busy we don't even notice the ways that you are blessing us. Help us to be mindful of the many blessings, especially right now as we see all the new life coming forward, all the flowers, tulips, and Oh gosh, so many beautiful flowers blooming. Help those to be a reminder of the new life that you offer us and invite us into. Lord, we know that it's important when we gather to not only give you all thanks and praise, but also to lift up to you the things that cause us fear and doubt and concern. So many things just get into our hearts and minds and fill us with um, angst, just not sure of things, worrying about things, what might happen, um, so many things. We ask, Lord, that you would just take those things from us. Help us to lay them down while we're here and put them in your good hands because we can rest in our faith in knowing that all things are in your hands and you're always working for our good and for abundant life. So help us to just release all of those things so that we might be filled with your gifts of grace and love and mercy and forgiveness so that that is what we share with others when we leave here and go into this world that is, it's in dire straits. It's hurting. So much pain. So much injustice. Help us to be bearers of the light of Christ the love of Christ, the mercy, the forgiveness. Help us to have those words rolling off of our tongues as we encounter others. We ask all of these things in the name of Jesus, and now we pray the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
time. I have a thank you announcement. Jeremy, the uh, Bible study went well. Thank you for doing that. Um, I see Lisa Reeves here in the back. Hey, Lisa. She's collecting goodies for college students, and today is the last day, so please see her if you would like to make a donation of something. Um, to go to the college students. I know they really appreciate those things that we send to them and remind them that we love them. Also, there's a note in here about the office being closed on Friday, March 31st, Friday, April 7th, and Monday, April 10th. And a cemetery committee reminder about getting old Christmas flowers um, off before Easter, try to clean up the cemetery before Easter. And then um, a note about Easter observances that I sort of just went over with you, um, but you can look at those in the bulletin. And then on the back, um, <clears throat> we will have prayer service on Tuesday as usual, 9 o'clock, and we will have Bible study on Wednesday at 2 o'clock as usual, and we're meeting back in that Sunday school classroom. And... Um, Last Sunday was UMCOR Sunday, and there was a bit of confusion um, because normally that's a day we take, or the big church takes a special offering and the money goes to UMCOR, but you know, I've been told not to take special offerings. So since um, I can't do that, I'm saying to you that if you would like to make a donation to UMCOR, which is the United Methodist Committee on Relief that goes in when there's a flood or hurricane or tornado and you know helps put people back together, 
um, there's an address listed here in the bulletin that you can send your check directly to them. And my understanding is when they do this special offering, you know, normally if there's like a big crisis, you put a special number on and it goes to that crisis, whatever they need in the crisis. But this one is like this general thing. This is going to get them what they need so they're prepared for any crisis. So it's not going to a specific crisis. It's more about getting them whatever they need. So just so you understand that. So all that information is right there that we can make donations towards UMCOR. And we are looking for singers and praise band members, and we're also looking for a piano player. So if you know anybody that sings or plays the piano, let us know, because Devin would like to have them. And uh, Prayer Shawl Ministry Group will be meeting Thursday, April 6th. So if you're part of that ministry, um, they'll meet in the old library in the children's department. Is there anything else that didn't make it into our announcements that you would like to lift up? Okay. If not, then I turn it back over to Devin. Please stand. Blessing and benediction. Go forth in peace in the sure knowledge that God is your help and God will be there for you and will answer your prayers maybe a little differently than you think that he's supposed to answer them, but he will answer them. So go forth in that sure knowledge that he is there with you, journeying with you. In the name of Jesus, amen.